Gorillas mentioned kinetics, Okazaki fragments, and the Hershey Chase experiments have in common? In addition to being core things every biochemist should know, they were all named, at least in part, after women. Mon Benton, Martha Chase, and Zuneko Okazaki were just a few of the countless female biochemists around the world that have done and continue to do amazing science. And so today I want to shout out some of my favorites, as well as provide links to posts where you can learn more all about them. We're talking some of the big names like Rosalind Franklin, as well as some you may not have heard of, like Barbara Lowe and Alice Ball. So let's dive in. There are very few equations named after women, but one of the most influential biochemical equations is. And so Maude Menton co-developed the michaelis menten equation with Leonor Michaelis, and it describes enzyme kinetics. So enzymes are basically these molecules that help speed up or catalyze reactions. And they're really cool because they can do this over and over and over again without getting used up. And different enzymes can work at different speeds, and how fast they can work is described by their kinetics. And so Mod Menton um, co-developed this equation that helps scientists measure these kinetics and relate them to concentrations. And so this is a key fundamental equation that is used all the time, all the time, all the time for a bunch of different enzymes. So super duper useful. When you see Michaelis Menton, think of Mod Menton. When you see the Hershey Chase experiments, think of Martha Chase. So she is the chase in the Hershey Chase, and she did not get enough credit. Um, so Alfred Hershey actually got the Nobel Prize in part for their work, and he didn't even credit her. Um, but she played a very, very key role in this, and this experiment played a key role in the history of biology and molecular biology. It helped show that nucleic acids, so like DNA or RNA, and not proteins, carry and transmit genetic information. So I have a whole post on the Hershey Chase experiments, but these are those famous, if you've heard of them, I guess famous, if you don't haven't heard of them, don't feel bad, um, but the blender experiments, the Warring blender experiments, where they basically took phages, which are these bacteria infecting viruses, and they labeled the phages um, DNA or the phages proteins, and then they got them to infect bacteria. And then they were able to show that only when they labeled the DNA was their information getting into the bacteria. Um, and so this was showing that the DNA was transmitting that genetic information. And so we have Martha Chase to thank for that. The Okazaki fragments are another thing named after a woman, at least in part, um, Suneko Okazaki and her husband Riki worked as a team to figure out how DNA can get replicated given that the copying machinery can only travel in one direction. And this leaves this kind of like lagging strand problem. And the Suneko Okazaki and her husband were able to figure out that this lagging strand was actually synthesized in these pieces, these fragments called Okazaki fragments that then get joined together. Um, and so they carried out this really awesome work. Um, for, um, tragically, her husband, Riki, died really early um, and she carried on their work, despite the fact that most people thought that as a woman, she should just like retire and take care of the children. Um, and so she was a great scientist. She's a great, she is a great scientist um, as well as really advocated for women in science, um, helping get scholarships and things like this for paying the way for, um, for other female scientists. So some really tremendous work. Rosalind Franklin, she is responsible um, for that photo 51, that, that like image that helps show that DNA was in a double helix that um, Watson and Crick used in order to um, do their like paper and things based on, based on this figure. Um, and so this figure, I should give credit to her graduate student, Raymond Gosling, who actually physically took the picture, um, but he was working in her lab and working with her. Um, and basically, this is a sort of image of DNA. Um, I have a post on how it, how you can kind of interpret it. But it was this image, this, this fuzzy X that helped show that DNA was in this double helix form. Rosalind Franklin also did a bunch of other work. She did some like virology. She did 
um, studying the structure of various carbons. So some cool, some cool work outside of ju just the DNA. Speaking of that picture of DNA, that's actually an X-ray diffraction image, not an X-ray crystallography image. Although, as I'll get into, there are many um, tremendous pioneering female crystallographers. So both of these techniques use X-ray diffraction. So basically, X-rays are these really energetic beams, of, um, and we can basically shine them at molecules. These mo these beams that we're shining, these like um, X-ray beams, they're going to kind of interact with the atoms in those molecules, and the then these X-rays are kind of going to get diffracted. So they're going to kind of get altered in their path, and then these diffracted rays are going to interact with one another and you get wave interference, and basically you get these different um, signals depending on the makeup of the molecules. And if these molecules are all stuck in place in a crystal, we call it extra crystallography. And in the case of that um, photo 51, this was actually a fiber. Um, so basically it was not in the crystal, it was just kind of like a long strand. But Oslin Franklin did do some crystallography too, as well as some like powder diffraction and things like this. And there are many, many, many influential female crystallographers. In fact, we have Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin to thank for basically all the protein crystallography that's done today. So she developed X-ray crystallography methods that are needed in order to solve the structures to figure out the atomic positions of the of things like within like the structure of proteins and vitamins and other big molecules. Um, and so she developed the methods that need, was needed to do this because she really, really wanted to see what they look like and the methods didn't exist. So she was able to use these methods, these new methods she developed in order to solve the structure of insulin, which led to help um, lead to the like designer insulin and things like this, long acting, short acting. Um, I guess fast acting, various forms of insulin that can be made because we understand its structure and we do that thanks to Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin. She also saw the structure of vitamin B12, with which I know vitamin, it might sound like, oh, oh that's this little thing, but this is actually a pretty complicated molecule. And she had, develop, she had to develop um, new techniques in order to, to figure out its structure. She also um, solved the structure of a lot of different molecules, including penicillin, which was solved with the help of her graduate student, Barbara Lowe. So Barbara Lowe is just one of the many um, female scientists that was either trained by um, Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin or a trainee, of, a trainee of Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin. And so Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, in addition to developing these methods that were so influential, was directly influential in training many female crystallographers. One of my um, favorite female crystallographers is Jane Richardson, who I've actually gotten to meet a few times. She's a crystallographer who actually invented that ribbon diagram to represent the proteins, re represent protein structures where you see like those alpha helices, those kind of like um, helices and these kind of ribbon form and these strands and these sheets. She basically invented this 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 way of showing showing this the beauty of proteins and by highlighting features of their backbones and these conserved structures and things like this and really um really making it easier to visualize the beauty of these proteins and see their overall form but she in addition to the beauty she also wants things to be like geometrically correct and everything so she's developed um along with her husband a number of software tools including mold probity which points out potential problems in structures and helps crystallographers and people using other techniques like cryo em when they're solving the structures of the protein making sure that they're actually um, solving them correctly and so this mold property software is really helpful for showing you where there might be errors. She also is, she also is incredibly generous in, into like sharing. And so she shares her images freely um, on like Wikimedia and things like this. And she shared time with me um, helping teach me some things at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories X-ray crystallography course. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm also grateful for um, Catalin Carico. 
Um, and you should be too if you benefited from one of those mRNA vaccines. Basically, she believed in this technology when no one else did, and she was able, even like willing to take a demotion so that she could continue working on it. Um, and she was able to figure out how to modify synthetic mRNA to make it less like generically immunogenic. So it didn't just like cause our bodies to react right away, um, which really helped pave the way for mRNA therapeutics and vaccines. Another um, female biochemist who has been influential in treatments of various conditions or medicine in general, I guess, um, was Alice Ball. She developed the first truly effective treatment for leprosy or Hansen's disease. Um, so I guess she was more of a chemist than a biochemist, but she was able to figure out how to extract like the active ingredient of this chalmugra oil, which was people were using to treat leprosy, but basically they didn't have a good method of delivering it. Um, and it's, from this oil form and she was able to figure out how they could extract that active ingredient and give just that. Um, unfortunately, she died tragically early and her like supervisor tried to take credit for her method. Um, but thankfully, later on, um, a, another person at the institution actually was like, no, Alice Ball did that. And now they, um, they gave her credit and they name a tree after her and things like this, um, but she still deserves more recognition. Hildegard Lamfram, she was a, another pioneering molecular biologist. Um, she helped develop one of the first cell tr free translation systems, which is still in use, this like rabbit reticulocyte lysate. Um, basically, it's this system based off of rabbit blood cells where you can get proteins made in a test tube. Um, and she used it to help figure out some really key things about, about how translation, about how protein making takes place. She was one of the first people to show the evidence of messenger RNA, as well as the evidence of polyribosomes. So basically multiple ribosomes making protein from the same messenger RNA. Sylvie Kornberg, if the name Kornberg sounds familiar for you, um, to you, she is often overshadowed by her husband, Arthur, and her son, Roger, um, who both won Nobel Prizes. But Sylvie Kornborg actually helped contribute to her husband's Nobel Prize on DNA polymerases or these DNA copying machines. Her husband and their colleagues were trying to basically figure out how this poly these polymerases were working but they were having problems and Sylvie Kornberg was able to figure out why they were having problems. Um, she discovered and isolated and characterized an enzyme that was degrading um, one of their components, um, one of the letters, so this deoxyguanosine, so the G in DNA, um, and so they were losing it before it could be added. Um, she also figured out how an enzyme could make long phosphate chains called polyphosphate or poly P. She found this um, based on this like polyphosphate kinase or PPK. So really cool stuff. One of my favorite female scientist stories is that of Alana Banga. She co-discovered actomycin, the actin-myosin protein combo that helps make your muscles move. And she did some really cool experiments um, showing like this stuff like dunking up and degunking and dunking up and then degunking as this like muscle contraction was happening outside of actual bodies, um, just like with proteins in a tube. So really cool stuff like that. But what's also really cool about her is that she saved her labs um, during World War II. Basically, she made it look like their lab was handling infectious material. And so then the invaders didn't, um, didn't touch it. There are many female scientists who contributed to HIV AIDS research. Um, so starting with Francois Barre Sanosi, um, who was one of the discoverers of HIV. Um, Flossie Wong Stahl, she basically, she was the first person to clone HIV. So basically to take the genetic information for HIV and stick it into a form where scientists could actually work with it. And she was able to determine the first complete HIV genome sequence. She also would um, characterize various things about the virus, including how it was very um, able to mutate. And she predicted the need for 
for multiple treatment strategies um, and in a, in, instead of just like a single drug, um, like a drug cocktail. And so she was very influential. Um, and yes, um, another person who has been really influential in terms of HIV treatment is Janet Litster Rideout. Um, she was one of the scientists who discovered that AZT can be used to treat HIV. So basically AZT is, um, it mimics one of the DNA letters, but it uh, messes, it doesn't have the group that the DNA letter needs to link on to the next letter. So basically, the when the virus is trying to do its reverse transcription, so basically take its, um, take its RNA and make it DNA that can then integrate into the genome of the host. Um, so basically stick its genetic information into our genetic information. When they try to go, in, when this reverse transcriptase goes to make its that DNA, it gets stuck because it uses this kind of decoy DNA molecule, AZT. And so Janet Litzer Rideout was one of the scientists who discovered that it could be used for this. And coming to really, really recent, um, we have Carolyn Bertozzi, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2022 for basically establishing the field of bioorthogonal chemistry, which is, I like to think of it as chemistry and biology that play nice to one another. Um, and so basically it takes advantage of the best things about chemistry, such as its versatility and its ability to do all sorts of different things, as well as biology, which is really specific, but not very versatile. And so basically she developed ways in which you could introduce chemically modified groups, chemically modified like molecular precursors or building blocks into living systems and get those living systems like those cells to actually use those modified molecules. And this could do, allow you to do things like label those molecules and track various molecules because these biological systems kind of get tricked into using these modified molecules, but then these modified molecules allow you to do cool um, chemical labeling and things like this. So those were just a few of many, many phenomenal female scientists. So I have more on th these women as well as other female scientists on my blog. And there are many, many, many more that I don't have information about. One of the reasons I don't have information about them is because it can be hard to find information about um, about women, um, about female scientists for various reasons. And so one of the ways that you can help out is by writing Wikipedia articles for them. So this is one of the ways that I got involved in learning about all these different female scientists um, was actually making Wikipedia pages for them. Um, and so... I have more information on my blog about how you can get involved in Wikipedia editing. Anybody can do it. It's not that hard. You don't have to write full articles. You can write like stubs, just kind of get things started and it can help people, um, can help people learn about these scientists. And I hope this helped you learn some things and appreciate the, some of the science that goes on um, thanks to some tremendous women.